I think most kids like goldfish, right? You don't like goldfish? Okay. So when you, when you and your parents came in, you got one of these. We call this a worship folder. On the back, there's some fill-in-the-blanks. Kids, if you will take the time and fill in the blanks, then you can come see Miss Bonnie, who's right over there. Miss Julie, Miss Julie, where are you? You can come see one of those two ladies that were just up here. They'll be up front here, and they'll have these um, goldfish for you if you fill this out. But you've got to fill it out, and um, I'm going to remind you as we go through the message today. Now, uh, parents, you don't get goldfish. I'm very sorry. I don't have enough goldfish for all the folks in here. But you can do me a huge favor. Um, as you look at the back side of that worship folder, um, we, have not for, we haven't done fill in the blanks on that for quite a long time because um, people said, you know, let's just have the blank space so we can write our own notes. And so I'm just curious if, as you look at that today, if a fill in the blank is kind of a helpful thing to you, I'd love to hear about it on the contact card. So fill that out in the contact card. Just give me, give me uh, your name would be great. And then love the fill in the blanks or yeah, let's, let's don't do the fill in the blanks. Um, so um, when Levi came up, he, he introduced, reminded us about the contact cards and he also reminded us about the prayer cards. And there are a couple of folks that I want to pray for as we, before we open up the word together. Um, and if you have prayer requests or needs, I really want to encourage you to let us know what they are. Um, put those on a prayer card. Uh, shoot us an email at the, at the office or send myself or Levi an email. Our contact information is in the worship folder. We would love to, to be praying for you because we know that God works in response to our prayers. But um, Dave Martin has been having some trouble with his eyes, and he had an eye surgery where they put a stint in his eye, and he's got to be Im uh, immobile for six weeks. So I want to pray for him. Uh, the surgery was successful, and it's just a matter of healing and staying immobile for a while. And then Crystal Dorrance um, is, in, uh, is home now. She had a surgery on her back, had to have some hardware replaced back there. Um, and uh, so we'll be praying for her for a couple of weeks. Uh, the pain is going to be pretty significant, and then it's supposed to gradually go away. So if we, you would remember those two folks throughout the week. Um, we won't always list off prayer requests, but I wanted to highlight those because those are a couple of, of folks that you can be praying for. But also, we found out about those prayer requests. We're able to, to be at the hospital for those things and also continue to pray for them. So let's pray together. Father, thank you for the wonder of our bodies. That simple song, head and shoulders, knees and toes. And, and then talking to the kids about what life would be like if some of our body parts weren't functioning or weren't right there. It reminds us um, the times when, when we have physical needs, when we've got problems. And um, thank you, God, for those who prayed for me after my back surgery and for the healing that's taken place in my body. Thank you, Father, for the way you guided the surgeons uh, with Dave's uh, delicate eye surgery. And I just pray that you'll, you'll enable him to, to be immobile um, and to do the things he needs to for the next six weeks and that healing would be complete and that he would um, be able to have uh, regain some of his eyesight and uh, uh, we just thank you for that. And then for Crystal, I pray that you would continue working in her body, that you'd bring complete healing. Uh, thank you that the nerve pain is gone and that um, the surgery uh, brought its own set of pains and I pray that healing would come uh, quickly for her and that she would be able to just uh, uh, get back to doing the things that she would love to do. Thank you, God, for giving us bodies that work well um, and those times when they don't work so well to remind us that you're good and that you give us good things and you sometimes allow those kind of things to happen in our lives to get us to slow down and to refocus ourselves on you. Thank you for the way you work in our bodies and for the healing you bring for the times when you just plain heal because we pray, and for the other times when you use the wisdom and insight of doctors and, and medical technicians to help us. And we just pray that your hand would continue to work in the lives of those we've prayed for and in the lives of everyone here who has a need. In Jesus' name, amen. So head and shoulders, knees and toes, eyes and ears and mouth and nose, 
head and shoulders, knees and toes. Just as our physical bodies can function well when we are healthy in every area of our, of our bodies, so the church can function well when we are healthy in every area of this body. Every single person who is a follower of Jesus Christ has been given gifts and abilities. Things that God wants to utilize in this church because this church isn't simply an organization. It really is an organism. It is a body. And we need to function together. A healthy, well-functioning body will work in unity. We will be able to work together like, like the kids if, if they had their fingers and everything was working and, and that those uh, crackers were on the, on the stage, they would have had to lean down and they would have had to reach and pick it up. Well, their eyes and their ears would be part of that. And bending, the, the, the joints in their knees and their hips and their feet would also be part of that. Every single one of those pieces are important. I can tell you with this, the surgeries that I've ended up having to have over the last six years or so, when one part doesn't work, you realize that, that lots of other parts are, are part of making something happen. And that one part affects all of it. So we're here as part of his body because he's got a role for each and every one of us to play. And he wants us to function together in unity. A healthy, well-functioning body works in unity, but there's more. There's so much more. And so Paul takes us into Ephesians chapter 4. <clears throat> Hello? <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4, you'll want to turn there. It's page 815, um, if you're using one of the pew Bibles. But Paul, in the first three chapters of, of Ephesians, is telling us what it, what it means to be in Christ. Remember, he tells us as followers of Christ, as disciples of Jesus, that we are now defined by being in Christ. We're not defined by our gender. We're not defined by our profession. We're not defined by being a retired person or a grandpa or, or, or a, a parent. We are defined as a follower of Jesus, as someone who is in Christ. And so what he's saying from the first three chapters, he's saying, here's who you are. And now from chapter four through six, he's going to say, now this is how you're supposed to live. Here's what's true about you. Now let's make it true in our lives. Okay? So verse 1 of chapter 4 starts like this. I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Since we are defined by our relationship with Jesus, that's the calling to which we've been called, and he's told us all about it. Let's live like it. Now to walk worthy... The image behind this, this phrase, to walk worthy, is really kind of interesting, and I never really, I never noticed this before. You ever see a scale that, that goes like this, and you put something on this side, and you put something on the other side to try to balance it out? Well, that's what this word means. That's the, that's the word picture behind it. He says, here's how you live, and here is how, or what is true of you. And what we want to do in the power of the Holy Spirit is we want for those to balance out so that what is true of me is how I live my life. What we know to be true of us shows up in how we treat other people. It shows up in how we see ourselves. It shows up in how we function in this life. You and I we are the greatest testimony of the truth of God's Word. People will, will look at the Bible and they will find discrepancies, they'll find all kinds of arguments, they'll find all kinds of things in there. But the greatest discrepancy people will have with the church isn't necessarily what they find in the pages of the Bible. It's what they find in the pages of our lives. So Paul is saying, I want you to walk worthy 
of the calling to which you've been called. I want you to, to, for your lifestyle to reflect what it means that you are in Christ. When your lifestyle does that, then what's going to happen is they're going to see, the people are going to see a, a church that is different and a church that is attractive. We believe that God has called First Baptist Church of Golden to become a force for good in Golden and beyond by being disciples of Jesus. Now, I think we can get behind that. We want to be a force for good in Golden and beyond, right? But the, the hinge pin, the, the most critical part of this is by being disciples of Jesus. Unless our lives balance out with what we know to be true then nobody will be attracted to that nobody's attracted to a hypocrite nobody's attracted to a phony we can fool people for a while but they'll see through us eventually and so Paul is saying that's not who you are you are in Christ and so let's figure out how to make our lives line up with that so in the next couple of verses he shows us three character qualities that God is growing in each and every one of us and these character qualities will continue to reform us to reshape us to make us like Christ and to help this church be who it should be the first quality that we just read about is humility. A humble person, and hit kids, here's one of the fill in the blanks. A humble person is someone who lives their life with joy. Joy is, is this. That, that a humble person puts Jesus first. A humble person puts others second. And a humble person puts yourself third. Jesus first, others second, and yourself third. A humble person is not someone who thinks less of themselves. Sometimes we feel like if we're going to be humble, then we have to, you know, pretend like we don't have any talents or abilities or, or that we're, we're not all that important. That's not what humility is. Oftentimes, that's actually a, a false pride, right? And we're really trying to draw attention to ourselves when we're saying, oh, I, I'm no good at that. A humble person isn't someone who thinks less of themselves. A humble person is someone who thinks of themselves less. Someone who thinks of others more. Jesus, others, and you. That's the first character quality. The second character quality is, is gentleness. Now, I've heard gentleness described as domesticated strength domesticated strength i mean you think about uh, a, a, a stallion that is just raging and roaring and pawing the ground well somebody gets a hold of that stallion and they train it and they can get it to do tricks they can get it to kneel down they can get it to do whatever they want it to do now some of you have dogs who need to learn this Domesticated strength. We got animals, and, and we have trained them to do different things, right? Well, that's what gentleness is. Gentleness is power under control. Another, another way that this, this word for gentleness is translated is meekness. Now, meekness is not weakness. Gentleness is not, is not weakness either. Gentleness is, is power under control. Now, if we think about this from the perspective of our emotions, we think about who we are as people. A psychologist would say that someone who is gentle is someone who is a non-anxious presence. There's someone who, who's, who, who, when they're in a situation that's tough or someone else is anxious, they don't allow that anxiety to suck them in. They're able to remain stable, whatever's happening around them. That's gentleness. That's gentleness. That's who... God calls us to be. He calls us to be humble. He calls us to be gentle. And the third, he calls us to be patient. A patient person, another fill in the blank, kids, 
never gives up. They endure to the end. A patient person endures to the end. Humility, gentleness, and patience are not, they're not character qualities that we come by naturally. These are character qualities that God is working in our lives through the Holy Spirit to grow up, to make us more like Him. See, the church is not our organization. The church is Jesus' body. And Jesus is in control of it. And He wants to shape and mold it. And it begins with us yielding ourselves to the Holy Spirit so that He can develop in us. What are they? Humility. Second one? Gentleness and? Let's try it again. Humility, gentleness, patience. That's what He wants in us. And when He sees those things happening in us, then, then the next thing that He will do is He will allow us, because He's equipping us, the next part of the verse says, to bear with one another in love. To bear with one another in love. Now, let me give you a better, more real translation of this phrase, bear with one another in love. Are you ready? You want to write this one down because it is good. Put up with one another. Put up with one another. I mean, that is a literal translation of the sentiment behind this, that, that God wants us to be able to put up with one another. When our thinking is guided by the Holy Spirit, we can put up with one another in love. When the Spirit is guiding us, He reminds us of the love that God had for us that drew us to Himself. And that love will enable us to put up with one another. We'll be able to endure one another's short, shortcomings in love because, here's the key, we are fully aware of our own flaws, our own faults, our own weaknesses, our own sin. And when we live life not feeling condemned by that, but being reminded where we came from, He fills us with love because He's accepted us just like we are. And it encourages us to bear with one another because He's growing us in humility and gentleness and patience. Humility, gentleness, patience. That'll be on the test at the end. When we are humble, when we're gentle, when we're patient, then and only then will we be able, in the power of the Spirit, not just trying to gut it out ourselves to do the next part of the verse, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit. Eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit. See, unity is what Jesus died for. And it is worth the struggle for us to continually yield ourselves. See, here's the thing. We, we all have different personalities. We all have different abilities, different gifts. We come from different parts of the world. We speak different languages. We, just, just from the simple fact of our gender differences, we look at the world differently. And if we are not all growing in Humbleness, gentleness, patience, allowing Him to wrap us in His love so that we can bear with or put up with one another. We will not be eager to maintain the unity of the bond of the Spirit. We won't. That's why churches are some of the most dangerous places on the, on the face of the earth. Because you got a bunch of people who, who feel like they've got all this thing down. They've got this knowledge. But the knowledge is not changing their hearts and lives. I long for us to be known in this community as a force for good in golden and beyond. But it will not happen 
unless we are allowing the Spirit. You're kind of getting the theme here, right? We're allowing the Spirit to grow us in our humility. Say it with me. Gentleness and patience. That's what we're about. That's what we want to see happen. Christians do not work to bring these things out. We work to yield ourselves to the Spirit so that He can bring them out. He's the only one that's going to make us humble and gentle and patient and allow us to maintain that last part of this, this little verse we looked at in the bond of peace. Peace is the bond that ties it all together. When we bear with one, or, one another in love, enabled by the Holy Spirit to be humble, gentle, and patient, it's only because we rest in the peace we have through Jesus Christ with God the Father. We sacrifice our self-serving desires when we recognize that we're at peace with God. And then unity grows. Remember what Jesus did because he was so secure in the love of his Father hanging on the cross his lifeblood ebbing from him. He looked out at all those people who were at that moment mocking him, who just hours before had beat him, had betrayed him, had ripped his body open with the, the, the whips and the blows and all the things that went on. With all that, Jesus looked out at the crowd who were still mocking him and said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And throughout his life, he had taught, hey, if they reject you, just know they're going to reject, if they, if they reject me, just know they're going to reject you. And, and what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to follow his example and not be angry and hateful towards people who reject us. We're supposed to instead, because we're humble, because we're gentle, because we're patient, we're supposed to endure just like Jesus did. But that is not something we can do on our own. The loving, peaceful unity is the natural outcome of us living up to the standard, walking worthy, living up to what it means to be in Christ. So here's the thing. Another couple fill in the blanks. God's unity motivates God's plan for our unity. Because God throughout all of eternity has been functioning together in a unity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that's what motivates his plan for us to be in unity. So the next few verses say this. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. The one hope he talks about there is supposed to be a very public hope. Not just something we hold near and dear in our hearts. It's something that's supposed to, to change the way we live. And change how people view us as God's people and as His church. The challenge I gave a couple weeks ago was for us to share God's grace with at least one person every day of the week. I will be honest with you and say that there are many times that I preach things that I'm not living all, as, all that well. And um, I took this one really to heart. And every day of that week, all throughout the week, I said, God, if you will bring someone into my path or take me into their sphere that needs your grace, I will listen and I will respond. So I've been going to Vasa to work out with uh, my daughter and work out for me after my surgery was sit in the hot tub, which I love that kind of workout. And I was still recuperating the, two weeks ago when I, when I gave this challenge. And I, I sat in the hot tub and I brought a book to read because usually that time of morning I'm by myself. But I prayed. I said, God, as I started the day and throughout the day, God, bring someone across my path um, that I can share your grace with. And a man named Felipe came in. And when Felipe sat down, I was reading my book. I finished what I was reading. I put it away. He's like, wow, that was, you're being really studious here. 
um, what are you what are you reading about and I started talking that was a really great way to break the break the ice and we began to talk about spiritual things and then he changed the subject and went on somewhere else well this week last week um, I, I've been praying for Felipe and and uh, Felipe came back and we had a conversation was able to share the gospel and had a really great uh, interaction with Felipe that was Monday uh, Tuesday as I was praying this prayer, God brought someone to mind who I, I, I knew was going through a, a rough time, so I stopped by to visit with them and prayed with them. Um, didn't tell them anything about that. I just said, you know, God put you on my heart, and I just thought I'd stop by and say hi. It was real simple. Then Connie and I were driving down the road, and there was a, a single mom. This is, uh, that was Tuesday. This is Wednesday. We're driving down the road together, and there was a, a, a lady, a very thin uh, lady, on the side of the road, just saying, single mom, have three kids, anything will help. And, and uh, she pulled out a, a card, a $10 gift card from Chick-fil-A. She handed it to the lady. That week was a week of, of grace. Now, I know that we weren't the only ones that did this. Because another lady told me, just a just, uh, couple days ago, that she took this to heart and was asking God to give her someone that she could share his grace with. And, and God brought her hairdresser to mind. And when she got there, she, she had been praying for this lady. And God gave her a conversation where it opened up into spiritual things. And she was just praising God for the opportunity. See, I don't know about you, but I need simple reminders. A simple reminder, just, God, this week, bring someone across my path that I can share your grace with. This day, let me have someone that I can share your grace with and I will do it. So I want to reissue that challenge. We say we want to be a force for good in golden and beyond by being disciples of Jesus. To be a disciple of Jesus simply means you take the grace God has given to you and share it with someone else. Now, how do we know when we are being a disciple? Well, Sharing his grace is, is one thing. But here's what it looks like for us at First Baptist Church to know that someone is a disciple. First of all, a disciple is someone who connects with God. Someone who has a vital and real connection with God. We not just come to church or, or, or go to a Bible study, but, but there's life in us because we know God and we love God and he, we know he loves us. But it doesn't stop there. A disciple is also someone who loves Jesus, loves him with everything they have. And now, none of us is, is there 100% all the time, but this is, this is a growth process. Discipleship is not, is not a, an end point. Discipleship is a journey. So we connect with God, and we keep that connection fresh. We love Jesus, and then we, we grow in our spiritual maturity. We grow to be more like him. Our, our, our walk becomes more worthy. We balance out what we know to be true with how we live. And then the final thing we do is we engage. We engage with the culture around us. We engage with the people around us. That's where this whole sharing grace every day of this week. And again, that's the challenge again this week. I don't think we can do this enough. Every place you are, every conversation you're involved in. If we allow God to remind us of the grace He's given us, then He will give us opportunities to share His grace. When humility, gentleness, and patience growing through this loving, peaceful unity, then the world will see a community that is different and that is attractive. The church should be a community made up of people who treat one another with the same grace that we have received. The church should be a community where we treat one another with the same grace that we have received. We become one body through the work of the Holy Spirit because we all have one Lord, as the passage says, and that Lord is Jesus. Because we all came to him by one faith. We didn't come any other way. 
Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but through him. As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the daughters and sons of God. And when we respond to his call by faith in Jesus, he takes us from hopelessly separated from God to hope in our connection with God and with one another. United into one body. And then the passage ends up by saying, um, by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, we're not going to dwell long here, but the baptism of the Holy Spirit is actually something that happens when you put your faith and trust in Jesus. It's not something that happens later. It happens when you put your faith and trust in Jesus. Now, being filled with the Spirit is something that continually happens. But the baptism of the Spirit, one quick passage just to drill this down if you have any questions about it. For in one Spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one Spirit, baptized into one body, the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit. So the Spirit has been at work in each and every one of us because of our faith in the Son. And it was all orchestrated by our Father who is, the verse says, of all, who is over all, and through all, and in all. The Father is the one who originated the idea and He holds it all together. So living in peaceful unity is the most powerful way we as a community of disciples can communicate God's grace to the world. Living in peaceful unity, that is, we're allowing God to grow in us humility, gentleness, and patience. When the community around us sees that happening, that is the most powerful witness for God that you could ever imagine. That's why he said, they will know you are my disciples because of your love for one another. Our unity, so here's the thing, when we function together in unity, it's a beautiful thing, but now Paul throws us a bit of a curveball. Our unity actually grows best in diversity. Our unity actually grows best in diversity. Now we're going to fly through the rest of this, this verse, this passage. Verse 7 says, But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Grace was given to each one of us. We all have been given gifts from Christ. Therefore it says, When he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he, and he gave gifts to men and women. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. What in the world is he saying with all that? First of all, we've all been given gifts. And what happened in ancient times when a king would conquer a city or conquer a region? He would give gifts to those generals and those people who made it all happen, the, 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 the soldiers on the ground. So he gave them gifts. Now, Jesus, as he was often did, he turned this concept on its head. And when he descended to the earth, he died in our place, paid for our sins, then he reascended back into heaven. That's what that middle section is all about. He sent the Holy Spirit down who was able to then give us gifts. Every single one of us. Now listen to this. The king who conquered an area gave gifts to those who helped him conquer that area. Our king gives us gifts so that we might be able to help him expand his kingdom. It's different. He's doing it for you and me so that we can use his gifts to be the people he wants us to be. Every single one of us is important. Every single gift is important. And he wants us to use them for his purposes. Now, he, he lists off only four, ver, four, four gifts. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. I think pastors and teachers is, is one gift. Um, the apostles and prophets, they're the ones who... Jesus used to lay the foundation for the church. How do we know that? Well, we we looked at it back in chapter 2. It reads this way. 
built on the foundation, talking about the church, of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. So he's saying that the apostles and prophets, they laid the foundation. And then he says, we've got evangelists, pastors, and teachers. He brings them alongside as well to continue the building. They work together to build up the church. Now, we're not going to focus a lot on those four gifts. You've, you've heard things about them and, and all that. But the thing that I want us to focus on is the last part of verse, verse, four, verse 12. Excuse me. Their purpose is to equip the saints for the work of ministry for the building of the body. The main job of those four gifted people is to make sure that the, the saints have everything they, they need to grow their, in their spiritual giftedness so that they can do their part in the body so that we can grow and build or he can grow and build up the body of Christ. Each member trained to use the gifts we've been given to do ministry. Each of us uniquely gifted by God to accomplish something that none of us could accomplish on our own. We need each other. Say that with me. We need each other. I want you to turn to the person next to you and say, I need you. We need each other. And when we are available to each other, we're yielding to the Spirit so that He can work in us and through us. Here's what happens. We the passage continues, attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood. We will not become mature as a body of Christ if we do not all use our gifts. You get that? To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. When we understand who we are and we understand the role we play in this incredible body of Christ, God will grow us up. And so he continues in verse 15, speaking the truth in love. Speaking the truth in love. Literally, you could translate the, the phrase there, truthing in love. And what's he saying? When we're growing up like this and we're, we're living this thing out, what we're doing is we are, we are putting flesh to the truth. We are living the truth. We are truthing in love. We see truth as a way of life. And when that happens... The end of verse 15 says that we will be able to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. Community coordinated spiritual growth. Community coordinated spiritual growth. The, the coordinator is the Spirit of God. But our part is to yield to him and to allow him to speak to us and show us what we need to do. What a fabulous thought. If we were all yielding ourselves to the Spirit of God and he were showing us how he wants to grow us in our humility, in our gentleness, and in our patience so that we will bear with one another or put up with one another so that we can work together to accomplish God's purposes. What in the world will God be able to do through us? Last part of verse 16 says, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped with each part working properly makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. When the body grows properly, when it functions properly, the body builds itself up in love. The body builds itself up in love. That means that we will help each other grow spiritually. It also means that we will be sharing our faith so that numerically we'll be growing I've shared this before, but I think it bears repeating. Truett Cathy, the man who started Chick-fil-A, was in a meeting with all of his board members. And he rarely said anything in these meetings. But they were wrangling over Boston Market. Boston Market had hit the, the, the scene like a storm. And they were putting up Boston markets all over the place. And, and, and the discussion was, we've got to build more Chick-fil-A restaurants. 
because we've got to keep up with Boston Market because they're going to take our market share. And they were wrangling over it. And finally, Truett Cathy slammed his hand down on the table. And he said, if we make sure we produce the best product, then our constituency will make sure that we grow. Our job is not to put together the best marketing plan. God already did that. You know what the marketing plan for the church is? You and me. If we are yielding to the Spirit and we're allowing Him to grow us in our humility and patience and we're loving each other, putting up with each other, and we're sharing grace wherever we go, He is going to change us so much that people will be attracted. When unity is planted in the soil of diversity, God will grow us all. When unity is planted in the soil of diversity, there's some fill in the blanks there for you kids, God grows us all. We need each other to achieve the fullest potential that Jesus has in mind for his church. We need each other. We need you to grow our unity. I want you to look at someone next to you and say, I need you to grow our unity. Come on now. To grow our unity. I, we need each other. Now, now so here's, here's a couple questions for you. Are you having trouble putting up with someone? Are you having trouble putting up with someone? Some of you are like, I'm having trouble putting up with you right now. Are you having trouble putting up with someone? Maybe God is prompting you to invite him to grow you in love. If you're having trouble putting up with someone, then maybe he's saying, I'm putting my finger on something here. You're not being very loving. But it's not, a, it's not a condemnation. It is, hey, this is an area you need to grow in. You ever catch yourself looking down on someone else? Their hair sticking up in the back. They're not, they're not dressed very well. You have a conversation with them, you have to back off because their breath is bad. You ever catch yourself looking down on someone else? Humility maybe the character trait that God is wanting to grow in you. You notice someone's annoying little habits? Anyone, anyone get on your nerves? You come to church and you see him coming and you, you're like, oh, look at the time. Or you, you don't want to necessarily engage. You, you have to go to the bathroom all of a sudden or get a drink. Maybe patience is what he wants to grow in you. Have you noticed that there's something that we don't do very well here? Or maybe we don't do it at all? Could it be that God has given you a gift that's going unutilized that could take care of that need in this body? We need each other to grow our unity, but we also need each other to grow our diversity. We're all different. And yet God is the only one who could bring us all together because the, the scriptures teach in this passage that every member is a minister. You are uniquely gifted to accomplish something that I could never, ever accomplish and that we will never do if you don't get involved. I think God is trying to say to us through this passage, that we, we need to unite in our diversity and God will continue growing us to be more like Christ. Unite in our diversity and let God continue to grow us together. Maybe you're here today and, and just that very first part of being a disciple, connecting with God is not something that you have ever done. You don't really know what it means to connect with God. You don't have a personal relationship with Him. I want to challenge you to consider beginning that relationship. The Bible says all of us are sinners. We are separated from God for all of eternity because of the wrong things we've done.
But God loved us so much that Jesus died in our place, paid for all of our sins, so that if we put our faith and trust in what he did for us on the cross, he will forgive us. He will bring us into his family. He will begin that process of changing us right then and there. As we close in prayer, if you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, I want to give you an opportunity to do that. You can just talk to God on your own. Maybe, maybe you're like, oh, man, that's too fast. That's good. Come at your own pace. Just know that your Father's waiting for you. Make sure you keep coming back so that you can listen to what he has to say to you. Let's pray together. God, we long, we long to experience the unity you want for us. We long to become the people you want us to be. But we just know we can't do it on our own. We need you to work in us. We need you to work through us. So we, we offer ourselves up to you. Father, show each of us, whether it's humility or gentleness or patience, that you want to grow in us this week. Remind us to ask you every day to show us somebody that we can share your grace with. If you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, but you really want to today, you can pray this simple prayer after me or you can pray on your own. Inviting God to come into your life. God, I understand that I have done wrong things. I've sinned. And my sin will separate me for all of eternity from you. So I confess that sin. And I ask you to forgive me. And I receive Jesus' death on my behalf. And I invite him to be my savior. And invite him to continue changing my life from here on out as he's my Lord as well. In Jesus' precious name.